But in fact, we have older manuscripts since the King James was drafted. And here, here's a good quote. There's a fella, he was the foremost Hebrew scholar in England at the time the 1611 version came out. His name was Hugh Broughton. And I got a quote from him. I think it's pretty good. He said this, the foremost Hebrew scholar, Hugh Broughton, at the time of the King James translator, he was asked to endorse it. I mean, this was like getting the president's signature. You always want some big name to endorse your book. A big-time author, he wants, to, he wants some big name to endorse his book. So say they asked this, Mr. Broughton, will you please endorse our, our version? This is what he said. He took a look at it. He said, I would rather be rent to pieces by wild horses than have had any part in the urging of such a wretched version of the Bible on the poor people. That was him talking, not me. I didn't say that. Uh, Marcia mentioned that uh, her mother was responsible for <laughs> their uh, musical interest and uh, getting them on the piano. And of course, her dad, Art, played the guitar a lot. And Art is also responsible for uh, introducing me to concordances. Uh, when I met my wife, I was uh, my wife to be. I was interested in the scriptures, but uh, I didn't know much about them. And Art had studied them for for years. And uh, he bought me a Strong's Concordance. And I, 15 years ago, I did not know what a concordance was. Seriously. And he, he told me about it, and he made me what I am today. <laughs> Look, he doesn't take credit for it. He doesn't want that. <laughs> you did it, Art. Thank you for everything. <laughs> I can take it from here. No, seriously, my father-in-law did introduce me to the truth that God is the Savior of all mankind. And I like to say that I grasped it right away. That's what I tell people. But Marcia says I fought him for a year. I can't remember that. Did, 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 I, did, I, did I fight you on that? Okay. <laughs> Austin? <laughs> Let's get on to the study. Uh, Onward and upward we go. Today, uh, the concordances do enter into my talk because I, the title of my talk today is Translation or Transmutation. What did I say? What did I say to upset Isaac? Did I upset him? Oh, oh I just, he doesn't want to hear it. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Isaac. He didn't like to hear his, uh, gra his grandpa saying that stuff about me. <laughs> I can't blame you. That wasn't. Now, now half my tapes run out. Okay, no. Um, what I want to do is shake our confidence a little bit in the common versions of Scripture that uh, we used to use, or maybe we do use the. I want to look into. details on the Word of God. I'm going to start out this way. I want to start out this way. Let's say that I start up an airport, all right? I start up an airport. I'm advertising flights. I'm advertising flights to Pittsburgh, L.A., Chicago, Miami, and New York. Maybe I'll call it Babbler Field. In any case, I'm starting an airport, okay? Now, I'm going to, you're going to see why I'm doing this. I'm starting an airport. I got flights to Pittsburgh, L.A., Chicago, Miami, New York. So I got people coming into my airport. Here I am behind the counter. I want to go to L.A., okay? You want to go to Chicago. You want to go to Miami. But I play a joke on everybody. I send everybody to Denver. I advertise all these different cities that I'm going to send you to, but joke's on you. Everybody goes to Denver. Now, how long is my airport going to be in business if I do something like that? It's not going to be in business very long. But in the King James Version of the Scriptures, we will find that where several Greek words are, they have given us one word. And I'm going to get into that, and I'm going to show you how it fits in with my airport uh, example that I just gave you there. In Psalm 12, verse 6, we learn that the words of Yahweh are clean words, silver 
refined in a kiln, fine gold, cupelled seven times. Cupel, don't let that word throw you like it did me. I had to look it up in the dictionary. But uh, cupel, it's, it's to take a piece of lead and to remove, by great heat, to remove the silver and the gold from lead. And this verse is telling us that the words of Yahweh, God's words, are refined like this. He's very careful with His words. And that they're refined and cupelled seven times. Now, seven is a very dear number to God. This number means, in the Hebrew, it means satisfaction. God is very satisfied with the number seven. And He is satisfied with the languages He chose to reveal Himself to man. He chose the Hebrew language, which is very rich. And He chose the Greek language. And they're very rich languages. And He purified all the words that He used. All right, to reveal himself to man. And another verse I want you to keep in mind is 2 Timothy 1.13. This is Paul's exhortation to Timothy to have a pattern of sound words. And you know, words are spiritual. Sometimes we find that uh, when we start looking at the words of Scripture under microscope, it, it, it seems that uh, it might not be a spiritual enterprise. Uh, Sometimes we think of spirituality as something other than furrowing the eyebrows and getting down into the Word of God. But uh, there's a good passage of Scripture I want to take you to. Uh, You don't have to turn here. But uh, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. I think this is very helpful. It has been for me in uh, my study of the Word. Paul says, 1 Corinthians now, chapter 2, verse 12, "...we obtain not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God." that we may be perceiving that which is being graciously given to us by God, which we are speaking also not with words taught by human wisdom, but with those taught by the Spirit. So there are words that are taught by the Spirit. All right, Matching spiritual blessings with spiritual words. So words are indeed spiritual, aren't they? Verse 15. He who is spiritual is examining all. So examination, examination, which is what I'm going to do a little bit of tonight, is spiritual. He who is spiritual is examining all. I have a list of 14 scriptures taken from the King James Bible, and I want to show you what has happened with the Word of God in the King James Version. Now, it might seem like I'm picking on the King James translators, and indeed, that's exactly what I I am doing. I want to confirm that. I want to confirm that for you. If you thought that's what I was doing, you're right. Um, You don't don't turn to these because I'm going to kind of give them rapid fire, all right? But in Matthew 2.12, there's a Greek word. Now, I will say one thing. My Greek pronunciations have not been cupelled seven times, all right? (laughs) They have not been tried, so they're, they're weak, and I, I uh, will thank you ahead of time for graciously overlooking my pronunciation problems with the Greek. I'm not an expert, but I do have a concordance, and that's, uh, concordance helps people like me to understand just what happened here with these translations. In uh, Matthew 2.12, there's a Greek word, anakario. It means retire. The King James translators in Matthew 2.12 translated it, depart. In Acts 19.12, there's another Greek word, apolasso. It means to clear. The King James translators translated it, depart. In Matthew 8.18, there's a Greek word that appears, aperkome. Totally different than those other two. It means to come away. King James translated it, depart. In Acts 28.25, there's a Greek word, apoluo. It means to dismiss. King James translators rendered it, depart. (coughs) Revelation 6.14, a Greek word there, apokorizo. It means to recoil. King James rendered it, depart. Luke 2.37, aphistomai. It means to withdraw. King James translated it, depart. Luke 9.33, diachorisme, it means detach. King James translated it, depart. Acts 13.14, I'm halfway through the list. Diachorisme, to pass through. 
King James translated it. Any guesses? Depart. Very good. Acts 17, 15. Eximai. You notice every Greek word I'm reading here is totally different. Different words with different meanings. And so far, the King James translated has used the same English word to translate all these different Greek words. And I'm on number 10 now. Uh, Matthew 9.31, exerkome, to come out, translated, depart. Matthew 20.29, ekporuome, it means to go out. That's what it means, to go out. King James translated it, depart. Acts 13.4, katerkome, you notice these all these different, anakarayo, apolasso, aperkome, apoluo. <coughs> Aphistomai, diachorizome, all these wonderful different little Greek words that have these meanings all lumped into one catch-all, depart. Where was I? 13. Metabeno is in John 13, 1. It means to proceed in the Greek. That's what it means to proceed. King James rendered it, depart. In Matthew 2, 9, poruome, to go, was translated by the King James translators, depart. And there's seven other places seven other 21 places in all where these different Greek words and these are words that God had refined these are words that each had a different meaning I just read them one meant retire one means clear one means come away dismiss recoil withdraw all these beautiful little shades of meaning all taken away from us in the King James Version, by one word, depart. So when you read the word depart in the King James Version, which word are you reading? Well, you have no idea. You have no idea, do you? That's like, uh, say, uh, DIY, okay, do-it-yourself store. They, they have an advertisement for uh, light fixtures, let's say. And they advertise all these beautiful different light fixtures. This goes along with my airport analogy and uh, they they advertise all these we got imports we got we got the French designs we got early American light fixtures so you can't wait to go into DIY to see this wonderful selection and you go there and they show you one old light fixture here it is this is it I thought you told me there was going to be a bunch of different ones a bunch of different designs and from different different countries this is it you're being ripped off, aren't you? You're being robbed. You are not being shown the loot. And you have to press them. You say, wait a minute, this was advertised. You got a bunch of different ones. I want to see them. And if you got to work hard and they'll finally let you in the back. Okay, okay, we'll show you. We actually got all of these. And that was the same way with my airport. I advertised different words, different towns, but I sent you to one place. You won't go to my airport anymore. But yet, the King James translators have robbed its readers of these beautiful little differences. God has a different... You know, God is not redundant. God is not redundant. That's why God chose the Greek language for, the, for His revelation because it was so rich. So many different words with different shades of meaning and we're being robbed. The King James readers are being robbed and thinking that they're actually seeing what is there. You see what I mean? It's, it's, it's robbery. A guy invited me to my house. I'm not slamming him too bad, am I? All right, well, I am? Okay, good. Well, I'm doing all right. I'm doing my job. We've got to bring up these facts. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just showing you the facts, okay? I had a guy once, uh, you remember Jonas Miller? When we went over to his house, it was a long time ago, but th this guy was, was pretty funny. He says, he says, welcome to my house. What do you want to drink? He opens the fridge just a little bit. He says, I got, I got root beer, I got Sprite, I got, uh, I got some uh, iced tea, you got some uh, orange drink, and I got some milk. I said, I'll take some milk. So he opens the fridge, and I look in the fridge. All he's got is milk. I said, what if I hadn't picked milk? I said, he said, I'd have been out of luck. <laughs> you see, he advertised all these different things that he didn't give me, and that's what we're seeing in the, in the King James Version. Um, so you have to work for it. That's what a concordance does. It shows you these translation flaws. If you look up the English word depart in either your Young's or your Strong's and a little concordance, you will find out. Holy mackerel! These people use depart for 21 different Greek words. But you have to go to the back door and knock. Hey, wait a minute. Let me see the rest of your goods. But the person who just assumes that they're getting the truth is in for a, 
Sorry, surprise. You notice in the last idle babbler, I had an insert in there. I said, if I haven't heard from you for a while, drop me a line. And uh, if you don't want the newsletter, you know, don't, you won't hurt my feelings. In fact, you'll be doing me a favor telling me if you don't want it. Uh, so one guy wrote and he checked, I, you know, he checked he wanted it, but he had a little condition. He said, I'll, I'll take your newsletter if you start teaching from the real Word of God. And of course, that was the King James Version, right? Uh, he, he wanted me to teach from the real Word of God, but, you know, there was, when the King James Version was written in 1611, or was translated, there was only eight manuscripts available. I mean, there have been over 200 discovered since then, including the four oldest ones, but these were not available to the translators. Not many people realize this, but I got inside information that uh, King James had 15 rules to the translators had to adhere to. They were not free to follow their urgings on these Greek words. One of them was you couldn't chew gum. I wouldn't translate either. I would get out of there. No, that wasn't one of them. But one of them was that uh, <laughs> one of them was that you had to toe the line with the English church. I mean, you couldn't go against accepted doctrine, you see. And so the translators were not free to do what they wanted to do. So what they did was they put a bunch of footnotes in it. They put a bunch of notes in the margin. Uh, that, well, this really means this, this really means that, but the, a lot of these notes were not brought forward when the King James went public. You see what I'm saying? And this is inter interesting, too. I don't know if you've re ever heard this, but in the preface to the King James uh, Bible, they said this, one, one, whoever wrote the preface said, we're, we're hoping to improve on works of others. And in fact, the King James was a... Uh, reversion of the Bishop's Bible, something that went before it. So it wasn't something new, you see. And they said this, that uh, we know that uh, we hope to improve on the work of others, knowing that others would follow and produce better versions. That was stricken. They didn't, let, they didn't let that go. So the marginal notes were gone. Do you know there was 14 additional books in the 1611 King James that aren't in the King James Version now? And you know that in the first year, there were two printings of the King James in the first year of its issue that, had, that were different. They weren't the same. There was wordings different. And so I would, happen, I would write this man. I haven't written him yet. I've got a stack of letters on my desk. I've got to answer. But I would write him and say, well, which, which issue are you, which, which version of this King James should is the Word of God? And this is another thing I would ask him. I would, I would try to be as respectful as I could, but I would challenge him to remember that the these people did not speak English. I mean, Jesus did not speak English. Paul did not speak English. I would ask this man, what if the originals were uncovered? Now, it's me. I'm, I'm hoping that they'll turn up at, at a garage sale in Schenectady someday or something. Somebody's going to find the original scriptures. And I said, now, what, what if these are found? Would you still revere the King James Version as you do? Would that still be the Word of God? Or would we go to work on this fantastic manuscript that we know came from the pen of Paul or John or Peter? But in fact, we have older manuscripts since the King James was drafted. And here, here's a good quote. There's a fella. He was the foremost Hebrew scholar in England at the time the 1611 Version came out. His name was Hugh Broughton, and I got a quote from him. I think it's pretty good. He said this, the foremost Hebrew scholar, Hugh Broughton, at the time of the King James Translator, he was asked to endorse it. I mean, this was like getting the president's signature. You always want some big name to endorse your book. A big-time author, he wants, to, he wants some big name to endorse his book. So say they asked this, Mr. Broughton, will you please endorse our, our version? This is what he said. He took a look at it. He said, I would rather be rent to pieces by wild horses than have had any part in the urging of such a wretched version of the Bible on the poor people. That was him talking, not me. I didn't say that. Uh, I, I like the concordant version, and I, I, I like it, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, is because the arranger, the compiler of the version, gave God credit for having these different subtleties of thought. And the concordant version gives each Greek word its own English equivalent. You see what I'm saying? You ever see one of those, one of those games where it's kind of like a wheel of fortune. You have a, a phrase, a secret phrase 
represented by dashes here. You don't know what it says. But you find out, and there's numbers underneath, okay? And you find out that each number represents a letter, right? And when you find out that 1 equals A, then every time you see 1, you put an A. And then eventually you get the message. This is just what happened in the concordant version, was each Greek word was assigned its own English equivalent. For instance, we had that Greek word anakero. That means retire. That word was given the English word retire. And that word retire was not used for any other Greek word. That's why it's so hard to read a word-for-word -word version. And the concordant version uh, is a word-for-word -word version as closely as possible allowing for some English idiom. But it's hard to read because there's some difficult words in here. There's some words that you don't hear very often. And people stumble at that. Why is, this, why is this literal version so hard to read? It's because the compiler took pains to stretch the English language to meet all these wonderful Greek words. And they only wanted to use one English word for each Greek word to keep separate what God has separated. So they had to stretch it. But... And you see, when you're using a method like this to translate the Scriptures, this is a beautiful method. Uh, this is a beautiful method because each word is given its own equivalent. The translators assigned this... Say this represents a Greek word. They gave it its own English equivalent. So every time they saw this Greek word, they used that English equivalent. They saw it here, they used it, they used it. And then the translators themselves have to stand back and see what they've created. You see what I mean? The translators themselves, once they've just brought the word up, no interpretation, no nothing, this is the way you translate. You don't interpret it, you don't try to color it according to a preconceived doctrine, but you bring it into the English exactly as possible. And then you yourself have to stand back and see what you've Created. That's an unbiased way of translating, and it was done as much as possible in the concordant version. And it's thrilling to get the uh, right Greek words. Now, I'm, I'm going to go back to that list. I'm going to go back to that list. And uh, anakario, that word that meant retire, the, the concordant trans, remember I told you King James translated all these depart? They translated it retire. But it meant clear, they translated it clear. Apokurame meant come away. They translated it come away. If when it meant dismiss, they translated it dismiss. Right down the line, recoil, withdraw, detach, pass through, be off, come out, go out. They brought it out word for word in the Greek. That's beautiful. That tells us what God says. I mean, if you're going to read the Bible, you might as well be reading what God has said. Why waste your time? when you're not getting behind the curtain. They're not being honest with you. And of course, if you want to lug around a concordance and read every word, you'll find that out. But how wonderful to have a version that puts, the con that, puts that equivalent in the text. That's why it's called a concordant version. The word concord in the English means to agree. That's simple what it is. Here's a version where the Greek words agree with the English word. This is the agree version. Things agree here. That's what concord means. All right? Now, I want to show you how the differences come out, these subtleties of meaning. Remember I told you in uh, Matthew 2.12, I told you that anakario was retire, and uh, King James translated depart. Here's the context. The wise men retired to their own country. That retire, it brings something out. It's like they were done with their business, and now they retired. It's like we've accomplished something, now we're going away. You just don't have that feeling, that beautiful, the color, do you, in the word depart. In Acts 19.12, Apollasso, clear. The context is Paul's handkerchiefs cleared diseases. Well, what a great picture that brings out. I can picture somebody's face just riddled with leprosy, and all of a sudden it's cleared. What a great word. Depart. King James says the disease departed. You're being robbed of color there. In uh, Matthew 8.18, at Perco, may it means come away. The context is Jesus orders His disciples to come away to the other side of the sea. What a great picture. I can almost see His arm beckoning them. Come away. King James says they departed to the other side. You're missing some color there. I'm not going to do every one of these. I'm just selecting a few. Apoluo means to dismiss. We read that in Acts 28.25. Paul dismissed the Jews. 
What a great word. He dismissed him. You're, you're dismissed. Get out of here. King James says the Jews departed. Again, a tired word used over and over and over. It is, script, it is translator's laziness. I don't know what else to call it. It's out and out laziness. Not to be careful that you're giving God credit for having these beautiful subtleties of meaning. These delicious differences of thought. God is not redundant. A couple more examples. In Luke 9.33, the Greek word is diachorisme. It means detach. The context is this. James and John detached from Jesus after the vision. They had just seen Him on the mount, and they detach. You can just picture, they're, they're not in His same league. They're not in His world. They detach. You can almost picture the separation. Depart doesn't give it to you. Here's a great one. I like this. Revelation 6.14, apokarizo, to recoil. The context is heaven recoils as a scroll rolling up. We read of the day of indignation. What a great... Can you picture it? Almost like one of the... Uh, uh, we don't have them here, but one of those blinds. <sighs> heaven recoils. What a rich word. Thank you for bringing that out. King James says, heaven departs. Heaven departs. The Jews departed. Jesus said, let's depart. Paul's handkerchief made diseases depart. The wise men departed. We're being robbed of light there. Acts 13, 4. I'm, gonna, I'm coming to a conclusion. When I get done with this, you think, what, what's he just, what, why is he just raving on these uh, translations? Because I'm going to come to a conclusion at the end that's important. Not that this isn't important, but I think you'll like it. Acts 13, 4. Cats are come. Come down, it means, to come down. Barnabas and Saul came down into Seleucia. They came down. It almost gives you the lay of the land, doesn't it? They came down. You picture it may be in a valley or something. What richness. They departed. Metabeno, to proceed. Jesus being aware His hour has come that He may be proceeding out of this world. You get the thought of progression, don't you? King James says He's going to depart the world. But what richness comes out with He's going to proceed. I think, that, I think that's enough examples to show you the richness that comes out... Yeah, it's almost, it's almost prickly. I mean, I, I hate to get a soulish word in here, but it's almost exciting to read a version that is giving God credit for all these variances of thought. And you really do feel like you're reading something extremely close to what the authors wrote. That, that, then that is a thrilling thing. It, it, it really is. Uh, back to my airport. I'm going to start another airport now. Only this time, I'm advertising flights to Atlanta. Atlanta's a big hub, right? A lot of flights come into Atlanta and go to other places. So I'm going to take you to Atlanta. You come to my airport, we're going to take you to Atlanta. All flights to Atlanta. All flights to Atlanta. So you want to go? i got ten people coming up. They want to go to Atlanta. Ha, ha, ha. My little joke again. I send some people to Atlanta. I send others to Cleveland. I send others to Detroit. I sent one guy to Washington. He wanted to go to Atlanta. I sent him to Washington. I sent one guy to Jacksonville, one guy to Charlotte. How long would that airport last? About as long as the other one. But here is another translation problem, the opposite of the one I just gave you. I showed you instances where several different Greek words were given one English word. Now, here's... I'm going to show you an example from the NIV, the New Inconsistent Version. I'm going to show you an example of where they took one Hebrew word and split it up into 44 different English words. Many with opposite meanings. Un absolutely unbelievable. The word is nephesh. The word is nephesh. And in the Hebrew, nephesh means soul. That's it, soul. It means soul. But in the New International Version, the NIV, they've translated it with 44 different words. You say, well, they're just trying to satisfy English idiom. They had to make the English make sense. So they're taking some liberties. You, you do the same. It's called literary license. Well, that's not so. Because some of these words have opposite meanings. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me put this over here. One word, nephesh. Now, this is recorded. You can get this. NIV, Matt got me this. This NIV exhaustive concordance. And there's a record of it. They had guts to publish this. I'll be honest with you. To see how they handled some of the original language, you know. They translated nephesh. The same word they translated life. 129 times.
they translated it death four times. What? The same word translated with opposite meanings, life and death. Something's rotten there. That's like having the same word for light and dark. You go to a restaurant and say, it's awful light in here. Sorry, sir, we'll pull the shades. No, no, I meant it was dark. I use that word for both. You can't do that. You cannot have one word that has opposite meanings. Words do not have opposite meanings. They may be used differently, but they don't mean opposite things. I can just picture, if you picture a poor NIV translator dialing 911. He dials 911. He says, hurry up to my house. You've got to get here quick. This is a, it's a matter of nephish and nephish. Nephish and nephish. Well, life and death, you idiot. It's the same thing to him. It's the same thing to the guy. Life and death. It's the same thing to the guy. I mean, I, I know it sounds like I'm picking on, but I'm just exposing this folly. You tell an NIV guy he's the death of the party and he thanks you. you know. It's bad. They translated nephish, same word, thirst, one time, and courage. Now, I don't know, is it just me or I can't get the correlation between thirst and courage unless in the NIV army they give you medals for being thirsty. The thirstier you are in the NIV army, the more medals you get if thirst and courage are synonymous. But these words are not synonymous. So how in the world can one Hebrew word, nephish, be translated life and death, first courage. I'm not following it. <laughs> the NIV translator translated nephish heart 16 times. They translated it neck twice. Now, I, I don't know, but maybe in, the, maybe in the NIV version of the Wizard of Oz, the tin man went around saying, if I only had a neck. <laughs> What's the difference? If heart and neck are the same thing, he might as well need a neck instead of a heart. It's just, it's just not right. Here's another one. I'm going to give you a couple more examples. I'm not going to belabor the point because I don't want to, if there's any NIV translators in the audience, I don't want to make you feel bad, but I do question your work here. Uh, They translated nephish, that's one that's supposed to be number one. They translated nephish, kill, one time, and feel, another time. Sir, that is a fine poodle you have. May I kill him? <laughs> what? No, I want to feel him. It's the same thing where I work. <laughs> kill, feel, what is the difference? One word? <laughs> No, no, there's a big difference between kill and feel. I got one more here. This is a really, this is a really wild one here. Uh, they translated it perfume once. <laughs> Wait do you see this. I just love to show you this. This is a thrill for me. Uh, and corpse. <laughs> perfume and corpse. Now, pity... Pity the poor girlfriend of the NIV translator who, when asked what she wants for her birthday, replies, perfume. <laughs> and can you imagine her surprise <laughs> when her husband comes home from a hard day of translating, pushing a gurney into the living room with a white sheet on it, all right? Perfume and corpse, oh boy. You know, it, it, it's funny, we laugh, but it's not funny when the, the folks who are reading, and I do feel for them, I'm not, I am kind of maybe poking fun, but I'm doing it to expose this, but I feel sorry, you know, for people who read this, and we do, I admire anyone who takes time to study God's Word, but you want to study it rightly, and to spend time reading a version that treats one word this way. This is my airport. I send you to Atlanta, but I send you to 12, 12 different towns. You're not going to come back to my airport. And you shouldn't go back to the NIV when you see that this is what they do. That's bad news. 
How could it happen? Oh, for, 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 I want to say, do say one thing. In the, the uh, Greek equivalent of nephesh in the New Testament is suke. That's the Greek equivalent. And it appears 103 times, okay? It appears 103 times in the Greek Scriptures. And uh, the NIV, true to form, has translated it life, soul, lives, minds, all being, man, people, thing, thing. They translated it thing. So, uh, but the concordant literal translation... 103 times they translated it soul. Isn't that wonderfully consistent? I mean, doesn't that make beautiful sense? That whenever you see nephesh, we're going to make it soul every time because that's what it means. There's nephesh, or when we see suke, we're going to translate it soul every time. None of this here, it means life. Here it means lives. Here it means mind. A mind is not a life. A life is not a mind. A man is not a thing. A people is not a mind. You can't mix them up like this. How could this happen? That's my question. Now, I'm going to read an excerpt to you from the NIV. How's my... I'm going to read an excerpt to you out of the NIV, uh, the introduction, okay? This is, the, this is the preface to the NIV. And they admit what they did, so I've got to give them credit for it. They, they do own up to it. Now, this is from the preface to the New International Version, which I have nicknamed the New Inconsistent Version. That's just what I've done with it. But the first concern of the translators has been the accuracy of the translation and its fidelity to the thought of the biblical writers. Well, I'm not so sure about that. But if they say they tried, okay, so they tried. They have weighed the significance of the lexical and grammatical details of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek text. At the same time, they have striven for more than a word-for-word translation. There's where they're getting into trouble. They've striven for more. What do they mean? This. This is what they mean. A sensitive feeling for style does not always accompany scholarship. Accordingly, the Committee on Bible Translation submitted the developing version to a number of stylistic consultants. In other words, they sent this to the beauty parlor. Once they did as best they could with the Greek, they sent it to the beauty parlor. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, truth is beautiful. I don't care how it reads. It might read awkward. It might sound stilted. It might not be music to your ears. But to me, truth is music. Give me the words that God said. I'll take it from there. Don't help me. Don't help me out. Just bring it across as accurately and as conscientiously as you can. I'll take it from there by the Spirit. The Spirit will help me understand it. Let me attain to it, but don't water it down. But look what they did. Accordingly, the Committee on Bible Translation submitted the developing version to a number of stylistic consultants. Two of them read every book of both the Old and New Testaments twice once before and once after the last major revision and made invaluable suggestions. Here's, here's the sentence. Now listen to this. Samples of the translation were tested for clarity and ease of reading by various kinds of people, young and old, highly educated and less well educated. Now for this, I'm going to need a volunteer from the audience. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> I can't believe you volunteered so quickly. This is your hot seat. This is your hot seat. I instructed Tony ahead of time to turn his hat backwards, and he has followed my instructions implicitly. Now, I am not, I repeat, I am not making fun. I never would do that, would I? What I am doing is showing you what happened. They admit that this is what they did. So I am merely acting it out and showing you how it happened. Now, catch this. This is what they said, did they not? They said that their first concern was accuracy. Well, okay, you know, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But the, after that, they took samples of the translation and they submitted it to different kinds of people to make sure it read easily. They submitted it to young and old, highly educated, and less well-educated. Now, I'm an NIV translator. Or let's just say I'm the representative of the company. I'm a company rep. Um, Sir, um, we, we, we kind of need your help. We've, uh, we've done up a version here, and we've tried to do our best in, in, the, in the Greek and in the Hebrew. And uh, I kind of need your help. Sir, do you mind if I ask you uh, a few questions, sir? No. Okay, good. Um, sir, did you, did you graduate uh, from college? 
Nope. Uh, sir, do you have a high school diploma? Nope. Uh, did, you get, did you get through the eighth grade, sir? Nope. Sir, you are just the person we are looking for, sir. I would like you to read, if you would, this verse. To Kohath belong the clans of the Amramites, Israelites, Hebronites, and Uzielites. These were the Kohathite clans. Sir, sir, do you, do you understand what you just read? Nope. <laughs> so at this point, at this point, the... Uh, Stylistic consultants took the version back to the drawing table. Now, this is just what they did. They submitted it to the less well-educated. In other words, they wanted a version that would meet the lowest common denominator. Nothing personal. You're just an example. All right. I'm just using you as a figure of speech. Okay? They, they, wanted, they had to meet the lowest common denominator. That's why they submitted this to the less well-educated. Now, folks, if I am reading God's Word... I want God's Word. And if their words are hard, if the words are difficult for me to understand, let it be that way. I want to have to attain to the translation. Don't bring it down for me. You're not doing me any favors. So this is what they did. They went back to the translating table and they redid it. And they made it easier. And they changed a few words, maybe just a couple. You know, maybe they made nephish into perfume or corpse or neck because this poor gentleman would understand it better. So, sir, we have uh, remade the version, sir, and uh, we'd like you to read that again. Now, how does, how does that read there? How does that verse read right there, sir? They were responsible for the care of the ark. Excellent. Did you understand that? Yes, sir. Oh, we got a version. We got a version. We have met the lowest common denominator. Thank you, lowest common. I mean, Tony. Do I, do I get a T-shirt? You get an NIV T-shirt for your help. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Let's have a round of applause for Tony Nungesser, ladies and gentlemen. Tony Nungesser. That was good. Thank you, Tony. Um, these Bibles, the NIV and the NASB, and I hate to say it really, this, I, I love this. This was the New American Standard Bible. This was my first Bible I ever had. I bought this in 1979. I love this Bible, but I don't use it anymore because I've come to see that it's not accurate. I have an emotional attachment to this. i got notes in here that I sweated over. This thing's torn to bits. I read it to pieces, and I don't use it anymore because I found something better. They have to sell Bibles today. The concordant version is the best, most accurate translation on the face of the earth. Now you ask me, then why can't I find it in a Christian bookstore? I just told you, it's the best, most accurate version on the face of the earth. Now, here's what I'm driving at. I hope I have enough tape left to tell what I'm driving at. The fate of billions of people that God created rests on a word in Scripture correctly translated. And it's a four-letter word, and it's ion. That is a noun. It has an adjective form, form. Ionion. Is it O or A there? OS. Ionios is the adjective form. Ion, Ionios. I told you what pains the concordant translators took to bring these over. Does this sound like an English word to you, Ion? Do you hear an English word in there? Eon. It sounds good. Every time we see ion, let's put eon. That makes perfect sense. It even sounds like it. In fact, Matt has a dictionary that uh, it's not in all dictionaries, but the one he gave me showed me that eon comes from the Greek word ion. And this is an adjective, aeonios. So they translate that eonian, having to do with eons. This is the adjective. It's built off the noun. An adjective can't mean more than the noun. Just like day, daily, hour, hourly. Ion, Ionios, Eon, Ionian. They translated it consistently. Every time they saw Ion, they brought it to Eon. And why did I say that 
Why did I say that the fate of billions rests on this word? Because the translators of the common versions, the NIV, the NASB, and others, the King James Version, have taken this one word and they have translated it several different destructive ways. The NIV has translated it age. They translated it world. They translated it eternal. You say, why is that a big deal? Because read Matthew 25, 46. I'm going to read this out of the King James Version. Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. I forgot to tell you that. They translated it everlasting. They translated the adjective everlasting. But I will tell you that eon... What is an eon? Do you know what an eon is? I haven't seen my uncle for an eon. I haven't seen him for a long time. And that is all an eon is. It is a long period of time. Every time it appears. Jesus talked about the end of an eon. He talked about the next eon. Eon, this word is pluralized in the Scripture. My father-in-law was the first one to tell me that, and I looked at it and saw that he was right. It's pluralized. You can't pluralize an everlasting. You can't have two everlastings, this eternity or that eternity. So we see faulty translating. In other words, we are trusting these versions to tell us the right thing. These versions that I have just taken pains to expose. They're being trusted today to tell the fate of humanity. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 out of the NIV, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. But no, it's not everlasting. A right translation is eonian, during the eons. But the eons aren't eternity. This is a temporary thing. The fate of these people rests on a right translation of this word. And we cannot count on these translators that I have talked about to give us the right idea. King James, they've translated it age, course, eternal, forever, and world. I didn't tell you this with the NIV. You know, they translated it eternal in one place and time in another place. That was like when I showed you what they did with nephesh, life and death. Opposite meanings. They did the same thing in the Greek scriptures with this word ionios. They translated it life, or they translated it time, one place, and eternity in another place. Time and eternity are diametric opposites. Eternity has nothing to do with time. Boy, you know, I, I ask people this when I give a talk on the, the subject of the eons. The first question I ask them, which gets their interest going, I said, is eternity a long time? Most people say, oh yeah, yeah, eternity is a long time. Eternity is not a long time. That will blow your mind right there. Eternity has nothing to do with time. How can one word mean time and eternity? It can't. It can't. But I will tell you that universal reconciliation can be proven from the Word of God using a right translation. A translation where the translator recognized that God had His meaning in mind. The concordant version is not the only version that brings out consistently these two, this key word. Young's literal translation also brings it over consistently. Rotherham brings it over consistently. And there's other versions. They might not do so well otherwise, but they do treat these consistently. And I know you might get mad. You say, why did God do this? Why did God allow these other versions to confuse so many people on this important subject? God didn't allow it. He caused it. God did this on purpose. Why? To show who is approved. 2 Timothy 2.15 says that we're to endeavor to present ourselves to God, an unashamed worker. You got to work to get in the back door and find out what God really said. And he made it that way. Proverb 25:2 says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the honor of kings to search it out. And that's what we're here for tonight. That's what we're here for this whole weekend to search out the matter. And on a matter as important as the salvation of humanity, we can't leave it to anything but sound translating principles. Father, thank You for Your Word, and I thank You for the hunger You've given us for Your Word. It's indescribable. It's indescribable that You have given us a revelation of Yourself. Give us the strength, the power, by Your Spirit, more and more, to apprehend Your revelation to man. In Your name I pray. Amen. Alright. I'm going to start this again. 
because this gives you the process. This is a nuts and bolts verse of how we got this way and why we sin and why human nature is fine apart from this poison coursing through our veins called mortality. Therefore, even as through one man sin entered the world and through sin death. Adam was the first man who sinned and because of that sin he began to die. God said to Adam, on the day you eat, if you eat, if you do what I told you not to do, on the day you do that, it seems like God knew he was going to do it. On the day that you do it, what he should have said was, uh, on the day that if the day should come, if this is what he should have said, this is what he should have said, according to the free will people. If the day were to come when you would do the thing that I told you not to do, then this and this and this. But instead he says, on the day you eat, this is like Jesus saying to Peter, uh, before the cock crows three times, you'll betray me. It's like, how do you know? How do you know? How did God know? Well, creation was subjected not willingly to this. So anyway, Adam sinned, and God said to him, on the day you sin, to die you shall be dying. The word is repeated in the Hebrew. To die you shall be dying. The King James and other versions say, you shall surely die. That's a bad translation because the word for death is in the text twice, but they just said, well, he, they must have just, Moses must have just put it in there for emphasis. So we'll say you'll surely die. How do you, let's ask these people, how do you do anything less than surely die? It's just like, what do you, do you die a little bit? It's like being a little bit pregnant. She's surely pregnant. These people are surely dead. Uh. No, to die, you shall be dying. Different parts of speech, too. The incomplete verb form and the complete verb form. To die, complete verb form, you shall be dying. Incomplete verb form. Beautifully illustrative of the actual process of dying leading to the fact of, of death. The process of dying leading to the fact of death. To die, to die, you shall be dying. You're dying is what God said to Adam, will result in your death. And this gets the whole, this solves the whole, I'm on a sidetrack here, this solves the whole thing of spiritual death. If, if you say that Adam died that day, on the day you eat it, you shall surely die. So people will say, well, Adam died that day. He died when he ate the fruit. Therefore, uh, death isn't really death, it's kind of like a spiritual death, which is a contradiction of terms. Spirit is life and death is the absence of life. I don't like it when that happens. But when you get the translation right, as the concordant version does, to die you shall be dying, that makes sense. He started to he started dying on that day. Adam sinned and he began dying, which eventuated in his death. This is how precise the word of God is. All right. So, through one human sin entered the world. Sin, that came first, sin with Adam. Sin came first because he wasn't dying yet. Sin, and through sin, death. So Adam sinned like a domino. And what ensued was his eventual death. And, and this here, death is a figure for the death process here. Death is a figure. Death is put here for the dying process. Through sin, death, and thus death passed through into all humanity on which all sinned. Death passed through. This is what comes through the genes. This, this is what comes through the DNA. Death is passed through. Sin is not transmitted to humanity. No, sin isn't. How can you transmit a sin? Adam disobeyed God, ate the fruit. And with, he's passing that sin onto me? No. But what he is passing on to me and you and everybody that came after him, except for uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, death passed through into all humanity on which all sinned. That's exact wording here. I know it sounds awkward, but it's literal. That's why it sounds awkward. I'd rather have literal than beautiful, harmonious, melodic, 
sentences strung together in the manner of the King James. Oh, the King James language, it's so beautiful. Oh, it so rouses my soul. It makes my soul sing. Thou art this, and thou art that, and the Lord cometh, and the Lord goeth. Oh, it's so... Who cares? Who cares? We want truth. I don't care how awkward it is. Let's attain to it. Let's don't dumb it down so that we can feel good because of how melodious it is. Forget that. Let's get the truth. Thus, death passed through into all mankind, on which all sinned. On which people who are dying on those people sin happens to those people who are dying the people who are dying sin why do they sin because they're dying death is operating in humanity that's why you sin you don't die because you're a sinner you sin because you're a dyer that was good did anybody record that oh I did yeah you don't die because you're a sinner. You sin because you are a dire. Uh, these are dire straits. These are dire times. And so it is death that is passed on. I'm going to continue this theme tomorrow. These people, if they were aware of what was going on, they would be cheering me on. And um, I know they're not going anywhere, so they will be able to hear what I have to say tomorrow, which is a turn of the coin, and you are, and you and they are going to love it.